To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let, let, my, let not my enemies exalt over me. Make me to know your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. God, you're here with us right now. And we don't have to wait any longer for you to speak. For this is the time that you have set apart so that you may speak your life-giving words to the church. And so God, we ask you that you would teach us, mold us, make us more like Christ in our thoughts, in our heart, in all of our actions so that we can finish the mission that you have called us to do, God. We don't want to be purposeless in our Christian, Christian walk. But God, that we ask that you would use us even now, speak to us even now, so that we may finish the mission to evangelize to those that you have called us to, to see souls saved, to see Christ glorified, for you to be worshipped in many more hearts. So God, do that life-changing work within our hearts right now. God, I submit myself to you. Lord, you know how much I fall short as a pastor, as a Christian. And Lord, I lean on your grace. I depend on the Holy Spirit, asking you, God, living God, speak through even someone like me. In Jesus' name, amen. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of uh, going to the U.S. for a couple of weeks to meet up with my family. My wife and my daughter had been out in the U.S. for just a couple of months, and it was finally for me uh, time to go out there to finish, uh, to, help, to join them as they finish off their vacation and just to spend some time in the U.S. And, and with that, I knew that I'd be in a plane uh, for quite some time. And, uh, you know, uh, going on a plane is a very unique situation where you can really share the gospel, right? You're forced to spend time with someone else for at least from here to Korea, here to the U.S., 14 plus hours-ish, right? And so with that, it's just a great opportunity. They're forced to be next to you, whether they like it or not, right? You have the, uh, the privilege to pour uh, prayers into them, whether they like it or not, right? So, and with that, and I've always been asking God, you know, give me an, an opportunity to really share the gospel. But really, it's been difficult. Usually people are reading their iPad, have head, headphones on, not interested in dialogue. So I had prayed the prayer, and as soon as I finished praying that prayer, uh, this girl uh, sits down right next to me. I'm thinking, oh, this is the perfect opportunity. But, you know, she's a girl, and I'm a boy. And it gets a little weird if I try to start you know, starting a conversation. I want to be very clear about my intentions. So, even that initial hello, I was, I didn't want to, you know, seem too eager, right? For me, I'm like, I get to share the gospel, but she may be thinking, who is this creepy man trying to talk to me? So, you know, as she uh, sits down, I kind of do this, like, half smile, and this, like, kind of half nod, because she's Asian, so I don't even know, like, should I bow to her? I don't really know that. So, I'm kind of doing this, like, weird, like, eh, right? And I'm sure she's thinking, like, oh, this guy is creepy, so intentionally, I, I take, a, take a few uh, minutes to just, you know, take a step back and let her know that you know, I'm not interested in that by any means. And, and so some time passes. Five minutes passes. Ten minutes pass. And now I'm thinking, oh no, the, the, the window is gone. I can't start a conversation anymore. Now it's awkward. So I just wait for you know, asking God, God, give me an, another opportunity. Well, she starts to play this video game on the console, and she starts to put it away, but the string that's, that's uh, tied to it, uh, she doesn't know how to put it back. And so I simply put my hand over there, and I, I pull the cord, and it starts to recoil. And she's so happy. She's like, ooh, right? And, I, and, and she says, thank you. And I'm like, you're welcome. And then she starts to ask me questions. I'm like, thank you, Lord, right? She starts to ask me questions. Why am I going to the U.S.? So immediately I know what to say, because again, I want to be very clear about my intentions. I tell her, I'm going to see my wife and my daughter uh, in the U.S. and to join them because I love them so much, right? And she's like, oh, okay. And then I show her pictures of my daughter and just me and my daughter just making goofy faces in the camera. She uh, 
sees the pictures, and immediately I could tell she's interested about something. And she asks, oh, you know, she says, you seem like you're such a good father. And immediately I know, I know exactly what to say to start sharing the gospel. So I tell her, I try to be the kind of father my God is to me. Her eyes open up and she's, she's dialed in. She's like, tell me more about your God. I'm like, it's like, it's like reading the book of Acts, right? It's like God is so working, it's so you know, saturated with the Holy Spirit. So basically I start sharing everything, right? And then I get to the point of starting to share like our sin. And especially in, in this day and age, it's hard to share that. So I start to share with her, you know, I believe we are actually not very good people. We're actually very selfish, evil inside. And in that, God doesn't like that. I guess God is very just and he doesn't want it, but he loves us so much. And I'm just sharing the gospel. And she's like, oh no, what happens, right? And I tell her, well, let's read John 3.16. So we open up John 3.16 and I read, God so loved the world that he sent his one only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And she's like, oh, I want to believe. I'm like, great. And she says, who is the only son? And I start to realize she's never heard the gospel. She's, she's heard about Christianity and about Jesus. She didn't know that Jesus was God's only, all these things. So I tell her, and I share with her the gospel. And I, t- and I tell her, if you simply trust him and believe, your sins are forgiven. He is your father. You have all of eternity set before you. And she's like, really? That's it? I was like, yeah, I mean, that's it. That's, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a gospel of grace. I don't know what to say. She's like, okay. So I, I lead her into a prayer. And so first I just simply pray for her. And then I tell her what to pray for. That you want to confess your sins, place your trust in God. But don't tell me this. Tell God this. And she, so she says like a 30-second prayer. She confesses her sins, her need for Jesus. And then afterwards, she looks up at me and she says, Wow, I've never felt so at peace in my life. And in my mind, I'm thinking like, you know, fist bump God, like, God, you did a good job. This is so awesome to have been a part of this story. Well, I know that she's, uh, you know, at this point in the conversation, I know that she's going to the U.S. Uh, she's going to be, a, uh, I think, in college at, at some point. And she's in college right now. And this is her first time out of China. And so for me, I'm thinking, like, she's got to get plugged into a church. It's imperative. It's so important. I know if she gets plugged into a church, it's going to be fine. It's going to be okay. But I know at the same time, if she, if she doesn't find a church, everything that happened right now, I don't know what's actually going to happen. So I was actually very, very worried. So after, you know, we split ways and I arrived in Chicago, you know, for, the, for several days, I, was, I just kept on praying for her, asking God, God, I pray that you would uh, minister to her, that you would send other Christians her way, her way, that she could find a church. And so basically after two weeks pass, I just can't stand anymore. So I go on Facebook and I look her up, right? And then, you know, again, I'm kind of worried, like I hope she doesn't get the wrong idea. Uh, but basically, I ask her, hey, you know, have you, were you able to find a church? Uh, she responds back right away, oh yeah, I just came back from church. I'm doing lunch with someone uh, from church right now. And in that moment, I'm just so blessed, knowing that she's going to be taken care of. Because I know that when you're plugged into a church, a real community, it's going to be Okay, and that's what we want to talk about today, the importance of church, what the role of the church is in our lives. So often, this is how we think of church, especially as a beginning Christian. We think that church is the end. It's the reason in which we are, we, we, it's the reason in which why we are Christian. We think, for me, because I'm Christian, I should go to church today. And so, so often for us, we come to church, we hear a sermon, we, hear, we sing songs of worship, we feel good inside, and then we walk back home thinking, we did a good job. I was a Christian today. But the thing is, the church was never supposed to be the end, but the means for something greater. And that's what we want to talk about today. What is it? The the church is a gift. It's a community that God has given us for something more, for better, for greater life. 
to understand all the grace that he pours out into us. What the church is actually supposed to do is, is enable us in all these ways to actually live the life that he wants us to live. And in that, that's what we want to look into t- t- today. So if you actually look inside your bulletins, you'll see an outline. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is community enables us to live like Christ. Can we repeat that? Community enables us to live like Christ. Acts 2.42 says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. These people, the book of Acts is the beginning of the church. As Jesus ascends, he tells them, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit in you, that each and every single one of you who believes in what I have done, you will have the Holy Spirit. And as you have the Holy Spirit, you have new longings. You're a new creation. You're a whole new being. And because of that, you'll have this desire to be with like-minded people, people who also love Jesus. And so in that, what we start to see in, 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 this, uh, in this verse are Christians coming together, celebrating the work of, work of God in their lives. And so what do they do? They devote themselves to the apostles' teachings. They hear sermons that the apostles teaches them about who Jesus is. And they grow deeper in this theology. But not only that, they devote themselves to the fellowship. They really know what it means to love each other and to be loved, to get to know each other and to be known. True fellowship. And with that, they devote themselves to the breaking of bread. In its most narrow sense, it's the idea of celebrating the Lord's death and resurrection. What we do in the first week of each month, we are are reminded, we tell ourselves about who, who Jesus is and what he has done for us. So every time we take the Lord's Supper, it's means of grace for us to understand what he has done. That's what, it, that, that, that's what they did in the most narrow sense. They celebrated, they celebrated the, the Lord's death and resurrection through the breaking of bread. But also they fellowshiped with food and, and they enjoyed that time together. And lastly, they devoted themselves to the prayers, reminding themselves, hey, we're not just hanging out with each other just because we like each other. No, we're we're hanging out with each other. We're doing community together because of who Jesus is. And so in this, in the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayers, what is this? It's the church, right? This is the church. The church is a place where you study the Bible, It's where you hear sermons. It's it's where you do Bible study. It's where you read books about who Jesus is. Right? You do fellowship with one another. You get to know people. You break bread together. You remind each other about who Jesus is in your life. And you devote yourselves to prayer, bowing before him, before each small group. Right? What this is a picture of is not just a church, but a church community. And there is a difference. Some people will say the church is a building, but we'll say the church is a church community. It's every single one of you seated here. You comprise the church. You are the people that actually make up OEM. And you see the way in which this actually unfolded in in verse uh, 43. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as he had need. I mean, just try to get your mind around that, right? People were selling their own possessions for other people who are in need. If I was to challenge that even to you right now saying there's someone in need can you just give to them even out of your lacking to sell something so that that person may be benefited it would be hard for you i know it'd be hard for me but it was this sense when someone was in 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 need someone else met their need and it was this community where everyone was giving to each other And if you've experienced that, when you were sick or hurting and someone loved you and met your needs, when that other person that loved on you is in need, but you want to give. It's not not a burden, but it's a privilege. 
And you see this beautiful community that was being formed. And in verse 46, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They had fellowship in the homes. They provided people into, into, their own, into their own living room, into their own house. And they did life together. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Praising God, having favor with all the people. They ate together. That's probably one thing that we are pretty good at, right? We eat together, we take each other out, we take them to all the good restaurants and eat Taiwan. Continue to do that, you're being obedient to God's word. Praise the Lord for your obedience. But lastly, this is what it also ends up looking like. Because of their obedience, because of this beautiful community where they love each other, they know each other, what happens? And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Beautiful. Wouldn't you want to be a part of a church like that to experience uh, God's work in that community in such a way? To be a part of a community where you are, if you are lacking, if you are in need, someone else in this church, if they find out about it, they would even give up sacrifice for you. And so when someone else is in sacrifice and as you were just uh, benefited, you would now return that. You would give to somebody else. And it was this beautiful community where people were loving on each other and through that, you were able to actually live as Christ intended you because it's saturated with the Holy Spirit. It's saturated in love. Some of us, we struggle with our faith and I think if we're we're very honest, God is not even very real. And you may be thinking, man, what's wrong with me? I used to be so on fire for Jesus. I used to be so obedient. I used to read his word daily. What happened to me? And you may be now telling yourself, I can't do it. It's too hard to be a Christian. Well, I'll respond to you by saying, yeah, that's right. You can't do it. You can't do it alone. You cannot be a Christian alone. That is not how God intended it. But together, as he shapes you through this community, what starts to happen as as God was, was, was once so distant, when someone else loves on you from this community, you experience God's love, the Holy Spirit working in your heart, and through that, God becomes alive in you. Our character, who we are, is primarily shaped by our primary community. The people that you spend the most amount of time with are the people that have the greatest influence in your life. It's just fact. And so therefore, if you are married to someone who loves Jesus, it encourages you, inspires you to love Jesus. If you're part of a community here at OEM where other people love Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, strength, even in times when you don't want to and you can't love Jesus, you see them simply worship with all their hearts. What does that do to you? Inspires you, strengthens you, enables you to love Jesus. You see this idea of as we love each other, we actually bless the world, is actually saturated also in Scripture. In very common uh, verses, where we think about it simply a single call of obedience, you'll start to see that most of Scripture, the, the, the author and God, what he, who he is addressing is not individuals, but collectively the church. Look at uh, Romans 12.1. Romans 12, 1, it's after the first 11 chapters of deep theology about what the gospel is, who Jesus is, what God is doing. It's the big a point where it turns, and, and in, in, in verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, to present your body, not just body, but bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The idea of it was not for a, a, a individual person consecrating themselves before God. But it was the idea that we together, OEM, OEM community together, the church together, 
we consecrate ourselves before God together. It was a communal experience. And so if you are struggling in your faith spiritually, you're thinking, I don't love God enough, what's wrong with me? Chances are you're not plugged into the community in such a way that when you are weak, when your desire is little, you don't have the other brother or sister to also consecrate their bodies before you and in doing so, encourage you and inspire you to love Jesus. You see, this idea is actually saturated in Scripture. Some of the most common verses are actually about the church being obedient and loving actually the church before it loves the world. Romans 12.10 Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Love one another with brotherly affection. This is family language. Love your brother, love your sister in the family of Christ. Outdo each other in honoring one another. Romans 15, 7. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. As Christ welcomes you, welcome each other. Remind each other of God's grace in your life. Ephesians 4, 2. Bear with one another and in love with humility, gentleness, and patience. Colossians 3.13 Forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. It's this idea of as a church, we have experienced so much grace. Now the call is show that grace, show that forgiveness to each other. That's the call. We're called to live in community, sacrificing together. And it's in this moment what happens that it inspires us, it enables us to be able to do things we didn't want to do before. It enables us to live like Christ. That's what the community does. You know, here in Korea, you don't see too many birds, right? Uh, but when you do see the birds, especially the geese, uh, I don't think I've actually seen geese in Korea, so if you don't know what that is, and if you're from Korea, you can Google it. But they're like ducks, right, kind of. But they're these big birds, right? Not the prettiest thing, but they always fly in this V formation noticed it? Birds that they fly, they fly in this V formation. Why do they do that? I looked it up. They fly in that V formation because together, in community, in this V-shaped form, they're able to go 70% further than flying alone. Can you believe that? They could go 70% for the, as they basically tailgate the person, the, the duck in front of them, they're able to, uh, there's less air resistance. And in doing that, they're, they're together, they're able to go 71% further. You struggle as a Christian? Well, the question is, you can't do it alone. Do you have a community? And if you don't have a community, are you willing to take yourself, put yourself out of that comfort zone, and get to join a small group with people that you may not know. But what you will see is in time, they will encourage you. That you can be, you could grow much more as a Christian. You could go 70% even further in obedience because you're in community. But not only that, when the geese, uh, when, the, when one goose falls out of formation, it quickly gets back into formation because they know that they need to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird immediately in front of them. It's a smart goose, right? When they fall out of formation, they know, oh, I need to get back into formation to receive all the benefits of community. A community, a, 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 a goose, knows the benefits of community. You know, as, as I was uh, writing the sermon out, I was actually thinking about, uh, you know, having the title for this, uh, this sermon as, are you, sm- are you smarter than a goose? Right? Because think about it. A goose knows that it needs to be in this formation, be in this group to really benefit. And the really question ends up being, do you know that? Or do you think you're strong enough, good enough? Right? Especially for younger, we definitely think that. We haven't experienced enough failure in life. The older you are, the better you understand that. But really the question is, are you smarter than the average goose? Where they will not try to... You may actually see that one goose flying around in Seoul all by himself. Then you could say, I'm better than that, that goose. I'm smarter than that one. But in general, for the, for the geese that know that they need to be in this community, the question is, do you know that? But it actually goes on further. 
When the lead goose gets tired, it rotates back into the formation, and another goose flies as a point, as a, as a point and the leader. You know, one thing I've been really uh, blessed by at OEM is, you know, the average, uh, the average lifetime of an OEM member is actually four years. So you think you'll be here for only one year, but so you don't commit, and then second year you, you realize you'll be there for more. So for the most part, the people who are getting involved are here for three to four years. Well, just a reminder that you may be here for longer, so get involved quicker. But one of the blessing things that I've experienced is, as small group leaders, uh, you know, usually go back home at some point, we always have an influx of new small group leaders. Even this semester, about half the small group leaders are new, if not, if not more than half. And I've been so blessed by that. Even in the past year, we've sent about seven small group leaders onto the mission field. I mean, how awesome is that? That our small group leaders now want to go and bless a different community, find other believers in that place to encourage, but also to be a witness to the, to the non-believers there. So even in the past year, we've sent about seven small group leaders to the Middle East, uh, to uh, Cambodia, Thailand, to these different places to do ministry. And it's such a blessing for me as new small group leaders, uh, as small group leaders leave, new small group leaders step up. My encouragement also to you then is if you've been at OEM for quite some time and you consider yourself fairly mature, to take that step of leading a small group even next semester so that you can bless someone, so that someone else can take a break and be strengthened. One more. These geese in a formation, they honk from behind to encourage those in front of them to keep up their speed. How awesome is that, right? As, as these geese are flying, they honk, 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 right? And in, in doing that, they're like, it's not, it's not like, a, it's not like you know, a car where you get frustrated, but it's like, oh, they're loving me, like honk, honk, right? And they, they feel so strengthened and encouraged. They know that they need, they need to be encouraged and strengthened. How much more for us? We're in the, you know, those leaders, your small group leaders, the pastors, the ministry leaders, they're on the front lines. They're the ones that are praying. They're the ones that are doing all this. One simple, simple email of encouragement to them will go a long ways. Encourage your leaders. Encourage your leaders this semester. Encourage your small group leader. Thank them at the end. Get them a gift. And this is the best part. When a goose gets sick or is wounded or shot down, two other geese, drop out of formation to follow, to help and protect. They stay, until, they stay with the goose until they are able to fly again or until that goose dies. How blessing is that, right? They know what it means to sacrifice. They, are, they have an agenda, right? They're probably going to the south to, to get some good sun and to rest for vacation. But as one of them is hurt, the two sacrifice. Not just one, but two sacrifice for that one that's hurting. You know, as I read, as I read about the, the geese, it's, it, there's just so many parallels that's alarming. And a part of me thinks, is this simply a lesson of community? What, what if the church was as smart and obedient as the average goose? where they know they need to be in community to survive? What if the church was like that? What if you were smarter than the goose? What would OEM be like? Tim Keller says this about uh, community. There is no more important means of discipleship than being deeply involved in the life of the church, the Christian community. Or another way to put it, the way in which we are discipled, the way in which we become like Christ is actually hanging out with the people we want to be like the most. That's discipleship. That's community. I want to encourage you, if you haven't joined a small group and you're struggling spiritually, there is no greater biblical answer than find a community. Join a small group. It's in that place. If you feel God is distant, God will become real. You'll be able to live like Christ. Community enables us to live like Christ, but also community enables us to love like Christ. Can we repeat that? Community enables us to love like Christ. 
Matthew 5.14, another very familiar passage. It says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Again, we've often understood this as, as I am obedient as I try to be that light in the workplace, God, use me to be that light, right? We think, we think of it as individual consecration, individual obedience. But if you actually look at this verse, and especially in the Greek, it's very clear. It says, you all. You can even say y'all, right? Y'all are the light. Not you all are light, but collectively, together, you are one gigantic light. It's not the sense of simply obedience to God individually, but together, as we do community together, as we live together, as we love on each other, as we, are, as we, as we receive love from each other, it's in that place we can truly be the light God has called us to be. And I can prove it to you even more in Matthew 5.1. In the beginning of this, of, this, of this chapter, it says of Jesus, seeing the crowds, so he sees the crowds, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and taught them. So we have to picture this. Jesus, he sees the crowds. So he's looking at the crowds, and the disciples come near. And then what does he do? Seeing the crowds, he speaks to his disciples. This is all about missions. This is all about outreach. And it's in these verses he talks about being the salt, being the light. And later on it talks about uh, those verses. He, he, you know, he uh, redefines the Old Testament. He says, if you, if you thought murder was bad, even hatred within your own heart is sin, he redefines it. And it's, it's, it's in, the, in, in this context of community. He's saying, as he sees the crowds, he's talking to his disciples about what it means for the disciples to do outreach to the crowds. And it's in that place he says, you need to love your neighbor. Don't hate your brother, but love that brother. Take that marriage seriously. If you look at a woman and you've, you've thought lustfully you know, about her, you've already committed adultery. And this is the idea of community. This is the idea of a new culture. And what God is saying is, as he talks to the disciples, he sees the cross and says, this is how we, the church, this is how we do missions. As we love each other in this way, the world will see, will see that the gospel is real, that God is real. So often you feel like you try to be that light in your workplace, trying to be obedient, trying to pray for that, but you feel like nothing happens. But what if one day, you're able to invite that person. You've, you've had all the theological debates about Jesus and who he is, and this person won't budge. However, if that person was able to join a small group, or just even visit a small group, and then they see that small group really loving, really loving people. Someone is sick. Someone's in debt because of a sickness, and they give to that. What that will do to that person is love will become real. And it's in that place God will become real. Jesus, seeing the crowd, spoke to the disciples about what it means to love each other. And it's in this sense we understand, we know what it means to be the light. John 17, 22 has the same exact idea, Right? The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Why? So that the world may know that you set me and love them even as you loved me. He says, by the love that you have for each other, the world will know that God is real, that the gospel is real, that the Holy Spirit is real. We cannot be the light individually. It is impossible. But together, as we love each other, as we show a new kind of culture of love, of grace, of forgiveness, people will see that and they'll want to become Christian. They'll want to know more about Jesus. You see, this is integral to missions. This is integral to outreach. Your involvement in this community 
Your involvement at OEM makes an impact on the outreach of OEM. Let me clarify that. Your commitment or your lack of commitment to the local church will either positively or negatively impact the mission of God. So you may be thinking, you take yourself apart from this church, you don't, you don't join a community, you just come here for Sundays. You may be thinking, I don't do any harm. If anyone, I'm just hurting myself by not plugging myself into a church. If anything, I am taking myself out of all the blessings that God has for me. And I'm willing to do that. I'll, t- I'll take the consequences. And you may, be, you may be thinking, I don't hurt anybody. But if you understand that God saved you, God saved the church together. I believe in God's grace and His sovereignty. He placed us here, even in this community, together so that we can love on each other and so that we can be a light here in Korea. Amen? You can positively or negatively impact the mission of OAM by your commitment to this church. You see, Jesus died for you. But he didn't just die for you so that you would come to church. No, he died for you so that you would have full life. He died for you so that you would understand fully within your heart heart, all the blessings that he has for you. And so in doing that, he dies for you and he places you in a church where you'll be taking care of love and you can also love and take care of others. And in doing that, you restore and redeem other people. And actually in doing that, we actually go out into the streets of Korea and you're able to love on them. If you feel like you aren't strong enough, big enough, bright enough to be the light in Korea, it's true. You individually are not strong enough, smart enough, bright enough to be the light of Korea. But I'll tell you this, the church together, as we love one another, together we can be that light. Amen? And that's what I want to challenge you with. Are you on mission with God? You may say you are. Then my next question to you would be, are you in a community? You can't really say you're on mission with God if you aren't being known and also knowing others, if you aren't being loved and loving others. And this has been the trend throughout history. This has been the main way that the church actually has done missions. Uh, one, uh, one sociologist named Rodney Stark actually looks at the history of Christianity and tries to figure out why is it from 12 disciples, how was it that this small religion was able to grow and explode and have a revival? Well, at that time, there were a lot of health epidemics where a lot of people would get sick and they would contract diseases. And the common thing was families who had a member of their family who was sick, would contract a disease, that family would actually take themselves out of the house, go to a new place, a new location, where that disease was not there. And they would leave that person uncared for, for death. It may seem so cruel, but it was a matter of survival. This is how these people survived. But the Christians, they didn't do that. The Christians, when someone in their household contracted a disease, the family would risk their health, even willing to suffer and die, to care for them. And it was in that, as non-Christians, as pagans saw this, they realized this love is different. It's not all about themselves. It's about each other. It's about this community. You see, this is how the church has always grown. It's in these times, especially today, right? You see all this religious warfare on the news today, this, relig- this violence for the sake of religion. I believe today, and I believe especially in the, in the years coming, it's going to be this kind of love, this sacrificial communal love that we have for each other, other people will, will say, yeah, they may not agree with lifestyle choices such as homosexuality, but they really love each other. And it's going to be in that they're going to say, wow, the gospel must be real. Wow, they must really believe that there's a God. Wow, they must really believe that their sins are truly paid for. Tullian, uh, Tertullian actually writes uh, about this time about what pagans would say about Christians. And this is what pagans would say about Christians. They would say, see how they love one another, 
how they are ready even to die for one another. Wouldn't that be beautiful if, if that's what non-Christians thought of their church today? They wouldn't be thinking about absolute truth and all, all that stuff is important. But they would, say, they would say, man, these Christians, although I don't agree with their thoughts or their doctrine, man, they really love each other. Man, they're, they're willing to even die for one another. Wouldn't that be great at OEM that was the reputation? And these people, yeah, they're, they're foreigners and they're, they're, they're coming to Korea. They don't all really know each other. There's all these clashing cultures. But OEM, they really love each other. I want to be a part of that community. The community enables us to love like Christ. And lastly, community enables us to intimately know Christ. Can we repeat that? The community enables us to intimately know Christ. John 1.3 That which, which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you that you too may have fellowship with us. And how did, how did he describe that fellowship? Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. What he is saying is, this fellowship that we have, as I love on you, as you love on me, what we actually experience is the fellowship with the Father and the Son. As you love on me, and as I, as I experience and, and receive your love, what's actually happening is I'm receiving the love from the Father. And in that, as I love you, you receive love from the Father. And it goes on. And it goes on to say, in verse 4, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. It doesn't say we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete, but it says we are writing these things, these things so that my joy, our joy may be complete. Not only does the love of Christ, Christ become real as you receive it from somebody else, but as you love someone, what you're actually doing is you're, you're leaving out your part as a body of Christ. John was called to write this letter, and in doing so, his joy was complete. In your service to other people, your joy actually is completed because God created you to serve in that way. And in doing so, you intimately come to know the love of Christ, the person of Christ. But also with that, when we start to do this in community, what will start to happen is that we will start to love and we will start to experience that love together. Not just like this, but together as one community. Hebrews 10.23 Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, in the ha- as is the habit of of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. As you love on me, as I love on you, as we, as we encourage each other, what will happen is together, oh yeah, we will experience a greater love, an experience of this love in Christ. C.S. Lewis talks about, in his, in his uh, book, Four Loves, this idea of, of different kinds of love. And he would say this, he would say, I and a person, we can get to know each other, fairly well, but when another person comes into this community, what will start to happen is though I know this person very well, this person will bring actually a different uh, perspective, a different color into that relationship. And in doing so, I'll actually know this person better. It's this idea, when you're in community, you're having this kind of relationship, you actually get to know what it really means to love. But let's, let's take that further. Think about you and God. Think about all the times you heard someone's testimony and you were so filled with worship. What's happening? That person, as he shares a testimony about God's grace in their life, what starts to happen is worship wells up within you because you're starting to know God in a completely new color, in a completely new way. And in doing so, it's only through the body of Christ that we could truly come to that place where we worship together. When you were younger, you ever play with magnets? Right? There, was, there was usually these stronger magnets, and what you can do is you could put paper clips on, you know, tied to it so that you could kind of see how strong this magnet is, and then you put one paper clip and another paper clip, and you basically try to see how strong is this 
paper clip. And at one point it would break. That's the community of God. And what I mean by that is we can fully experience the grace and love of God as we're connected to each other. And it's in that we can experience to the extent of which God pours out his grace into this community, we start to experience how each other, how all of us together, we experience that community. It's together that we can fully tap in to all that God desires for us in this community. And you may be thinking to yourself, I'm not hurting anyone. But the question is, you can and you are able to actually love on someone. I have some candles here, and if the... If, if we can get, uh, get it up here. What I want to be able to do is help you understand, help you to see this idea of community. And I mentioned before that we're all, we're all like, we, we, we often consider ourselves people who are individual lights. But what you will start to see is that as we come together, yes, we become brighter. But in that, the idea of it is there's so much more for us. If we could kill the lights, and we're actually going to cut off all the lights here. And if you're scared of the dark, uh, it's quite okay. Uh, Jesus is still here, and he is with you. But So here's the light, right? And I'm going to light one candle. Okay? You can't really see much. And this is what we're trying to do, I think, in our workplace. We go to our workplace, we try to be the light that we can, and in that, in that we feel like we're not being effective. That person knows that I talk about love, but does that person really experience love? And what I'm going to ask these people to do is light all the candles on this table. There's about, there's about 150 candles. I wish we were able to have a candle for each person here, because what I want to be able to do is have, have us understand this important truth that we cannot be the light apart from each other. And what you will start to see happen is that in your own Christian walk, as you try to witness to that person in the workplace, you're not sufficient. Yes, there'll be times God pours out your grace into that person's life and that person becomes Christian, but the way in which God actually designed it is that the world will know. The atheist will know. The agnostic will know. Those of other religions will know that the love of God is real, that God is real, that Jesus Christ is real, the gospel is real. Why? How? By the love that we have for each other. You know, so often we can say, hey, look at Mother Teresa. You know, she's someone who's a Christian and loves like nobody else. But you know what most people will say to that? That's one in many Many people who are very, very moral. And I would actually agree with that. But the thing is, when the church, when every single person seated here, when the church is committed to the church, and you love each other in that way, you know what happens? They won't be able to deny you know, 800 people loving When they see 800 people loving, they won't be able to deny, wow, the gospel is real. And already as they light up all of these candles, I could already start to see some of your faces. It's important that, yes, we come together and we're a brighter light. But you know, this analogy will ultimately fall short. You know why? Because as I said before, we're not individual lights. But you know what what it's really like? It's like this idea, not only are we all candles coming together, creating this big fire, but actually each one of us, we're like a strand of a gigantic wick, a gigantic candle. And all of us together, as we love one another, and think about this, as, as Christians internationally, Try to love each other, even for us praying for those Christians in the Middle East, sending different needs, supplies to them. It's in this, we make one gigantic candle. And it's in that place people will see such a fire, such a passion, such a love amongst the Christians that they will not be able to deny the power of the gospel. They will not be able to deny 
the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? For you, the question is, do you want to be a part of the wick? And if so, what can you do to play your part, your role as believers? This is just 150 candles. Imagine 800 or so candles here today, representing each person here. Imagine the millions of Christians all around the world. If we became one big candle, what kind of witness would that be? How could, Chris, how could people not deny the love of Christ? And in that, can we bow our heads? We can actually turn on the lights. And I want to challenge you with that. So often we think we try to be the light on our own. But biblically, you cannot be the light on your own. You cannot be bright enough. But it's only together, as you and I, we love each other. It's only in that place the world will know. Let's play our part in finishing the mission of God by simply loving each other here. Can we do that? Can we bow our heads? And I know, I know that our church is not perfect. I'll be the first to admit our church is not perfect. I'll be the first to admit that our small group ministry still has a long ways to go. But at the same time, I want to challenge you. And I believe God is challenging some of you. And say, how long will you say it's okay? How long will you say that it's okay for you not to be in community? But what God is saying to you is, I died for you so that you would have so much more. I died for you so that you would know what it means to truly love and be loved. God is saying, I died for you so that you would finish the mission that I started. I saved you so that you would be a part of every nation all around the world knowing the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I know many of us, we don't purposefully not join, but it just hasn't happened yet. And I want to challenge you tonight, today. Go before the Lord. The ways in which He calls you, the ways in which He convicts you, be obedient to Him. Not because you have to, but the question is, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you give yourself to the plan in which God has given to you? He has and wants so much more for you. Let's go to Him in prayer and see which ways we can be a blessing to the OEM community.